um, designers who predict uses are really inadequate at, will never ever be able to predict um, the deferred uses, which might lead to uh, interesting scenarios. Um, but of course, this ubiquitous idea is very, still very popular with nerds um, because it, it's a form of heroic engineering, especially because nerds will say how things are going and how they will be used. It feels uh, very attractive. In that sense, ubiquitous computing is very much a technological determinist ver uh, vision. Uh, McKay, Young, and Benyon describe it as uh, uh, technological determinism is this, this notion that technology is parachuted into society and really changes it. It has an impact. Often you'll find people talking about technology saying the impact it has on our society. But this is a very dubious idea. This is one side of the coin because you could also say that you know, technology isn't something that's been pushed on us. We, we, we take it in. Like, for instance, with SMS, we are the people who decided, hey, this is useful, and we took it and, and, and made it our own. Um, so this is very much an ideological uh, ideology, ideology, ideology uh, debate about how you look at technology. And um, McKay, Young, and Benny, 1991, uh, explained that if you look at technology as something that just happens to you, as something that is forced upon you, then uh, clearly such an approach engenders a passivity with regard to technology. It's going to happen anyway. And technological determinism diverts attention from such questions as the relationships of technology to human need. Implicit in technological determinism is that there is no choice about technology which we have. So why would you create, for instance, a privacy law if technology is going to happen anyway? And you often find this, this certain defeatist attitude around technology. You know, oh, it's going to happen anyway, and I have nothing to hide. And oh, it's going to happen anyway. What can we do about it? Which in a sense, creates a self-fulfilling prophecy where, because no one does anything, nothing really happens. Um, this is an example I always like, it's, it's the bathtub, to create this, this, this notion of the black box that, that ubiquitous computing wants to create. Imagine this is a highly futuristic bathtub, and it, it knows when you come home, uh, and, and it knows your patterns of work and, and when you like to take baths. And it's learned this over a, a little while. But one night you come home and you're, oh, yes, I want a bath. And you expect a bathtub to be full and ready for you. But, but it's not full. And you're like, shit, what's going on? I mean, you wouldn't know what was wrong. I mean, it could be that the water's not there. It could be that the data that holds your patterns is corrupted. It could be that the water sensor thinks it's already full. You don't know. And, and that's the, the, um, the problem when you create, want to create invisible, invisible systems, that you create this black, extreme black box environment where... It's very difficult for the end user to understand anything that's going on. Like we said, that kind of makes them dumb in a way. Um, so I think nerds are a bit arrogant in that, in that sense. Uh, I find it uh, dubious that um, uh, we do believe that we know best and that we think that we can create systems that will work for everybody. So what does happen? I think that while we dream about revolutions, the real future evolves right under our noses. In a sense, what Mark Weiser claimed has happened. Computers have become smaller and they have become ubiquitous. It's just that they're not invisible at all because no one wants that. People love the iPhone, people love the gadgets, they love the things it can do. People love playing with it, tinkering with it. I mean, this is, um, and it's not invisible at all. I mean, to the, the, the Metaphorically, you could say, you know, people put their phones on the table and when they get into a bar just to show it off. They don't want invisible uh, phones. Um, so, could you could just computing ever happen? Um, well, in our research, we came to the conclusion that there had to be a, a web or a, a 2.0 version of the ubiquitous computing ideal, just like there had been in the artificial intelligence world. There has to be a paradigm shift in, in how people look at it. For instance, with artificial intelligence, there was first this idea that we're going to model the brain. If we make it big enough, we'll just copy it. But later on, it, that never worked. And people said, OK, well, what if we took the bottom-up approach? And that's what they're working on now, uh, by creating small systems that will work together and then create some kind of intelligence. For ubiquitous computing, if we want to continue with ubiquitous computing, we'll have to take this same type of bottom-up approach. We'll have to stop thinking that we know best how to create these huge systems and designers will have to uh, take into account that people are actually rather smart and um, could work these systems pretty well, and we should have to take them as partners instead of 
people who are below us in the sense that we are designing for. Um, another way that we could work, and that's already working, is we just keep the system small. You could create one room that's very much decked out with technology and sensors, and that you know the situation better, then there really will be uh, times when thought runs along an accepted groove, um, as we saw. And then you really could predict this, but often, uh, if you make it too big, it won't work. And um, we have to stop wanting technology to be invisible. We really have to stop doing that. And I find that the mobile phone is, is such a great example. Um, Belen Durish uh, went to Singapore to do some research on this. Um, and what they saw was that people there use their phone for pretty much everything. There's numbers on the sides of, of houses in Uringham and that belongs to a taxi service who then immediately knows where you are and will come pick you up in no time. To a certain extent, that is really smart environment. That's smart, but it's just not what we envisioned. It has become something totally different. Um, so what Bell and Doris in their research claim is that our suggestion that ubiquitous computing already here... No, um, they, they, they say this, they say ubiquitous computing is really already here, but just not as we expected it to be. It's, it's a mobile phone. And they say our suggestion that ubiquitous computing is already here in the form of densely available computing and communication resources is sometimes met with an objection that these technologies remain less than ubiquitous in the sense that Weiser suggested. Mobile telephony, after all, offers widespread coverage, but is neither truly ubiquitous nor truly seamless. Incompatible standards, spotty regional coverage, etc. They seem like obstacles, obstacles that we must overcome, that we still must overcome before the ubiquitous computing vision can be realized. But postulating a seamless infrastructure is a strategy whereby the messy presence can be ignored. Although infrastructure is always evenly distributed, always messy. An indefinitely postponed ubiquitous future is one that never need take account of this complexity. So by creating this vision of this perfect technological system that's right around the corner, we, ignore the, we can ignore the messiness of our real technological environment, which, uh, oddly enough, I find way more interesting. I find it very interesting how people use mobile phones in, in unprotected ways, and I find this could be a strength, and I think something that we really should research, as is luckily being done. So what should we take away? I mean, we've, we've all, we look at this and we think it's funny, you know, flying through the sky in the year 2000, but we keep doing this. Um, we keep thinking when new technology arrives that, uh, or we create new visions that this is going to be great and it's going to solve our current technological mayhem and our current messy situation. We keep thinking it's going to be um, this awesome situation. It's going to change so much. Like TV will mean the end of war and that we'll get the paperless office and we will all live in cyberspace. Time after time we find this highly idealized notions of what our future is going to look like, and time after time we find that they never happen. They keep coming in the next five to ten years. And I'll go on slash dots and I'll find someone who says, yes, in ten years we'll have artificial intelligence. And I keep going, shut up. <laughs> so um, that really is something that, I, that I'm very critical of and um, still see a lot. For instance, um, Hans Moravec, who was a researcher, coined this idea of, of transhumanism, which in all sense is basically the idea of the Borg, that we will uh, become more than humans, we will upload our brain into satellites orbiting the Earth and then explore the galaxy in uh, technological uh, spaceships. And he really believes this is very viable and it's going to happen really, really soon. And it's really no different from ideas that are very popular right now, which is the thing